Good. So let us begin. Welcome back with our quantum field theory discussion of free particles and free field quantization. Today we reach the climax of our build-up. Namely, we will finally discuss spin one and uh, the massless case, the case of the photon and similar particles with uh, spin one. We have worked to this point for many weeks and uh, we had already many remarks concerning gauge invariants and concerning the special problems which uh, are connected to this case and so now we are able to discuss it. With our experience we will actually uh, be able to change the order of the subsections of this overall section a little bit because we will not completely follow our standard blueprint because instead we will directly jump to the critical points because I think we will immediately be able to understand what are the important changes compared to the previous cases and so in this way we will understand better this particular case. So today we will mainly be concerned with those critical extra discussions which are specific to the spin one massless case and tomorrow we will collect everything and uh, uh, discuss it from the usual group lint uh, point of view. So today I want to begin in the following way. From 4 to 2 degrees of freedom. That is the first obvious discussion that we have already mentioned many many times because we know that our spin one vector field A mu has four components. However, we also know that a massless photon with a spin one has two degrees of freedom, namely it has helicity plus or minus one, and therefore we need to reduce the number of degrees of freedom somehow by two. In the case of the massive spin one particle, we had to go from four to three degrees of freedom, and we did that by having a field A mu which was divergence free, d mu a mu equals zero. That equation reduced the number of freedom, uh, degrees of freedom by one unit, but here we need to reduce the number by two, and the question is how can we do that? And let me just give you some very simple indication how you can go from four to two degrees of freedom um, in a four-dimensional vector space sense. Namely, uh, think of the Minkowski space, which has four dimensions. Minkowski space is uh, the space where all the momenta in particular and all the polarization vectors, epsilon, mu, where they live. And how can you define in a physically sensible way a two-dimensional subspace of the four-dimensional Minkowski space? How can you do that? Uh, you can do it, of course, in many uh, trivial ways, like you can consider the xy plane. That is for sure a two-dimensional subspace, but that is not a covariant definition uh, of a two-dimensional subspace which is adapted to a particle which can have some uh, non-vanishing momentum and which you want to rotate and uh, which you want to Lorentz transform. So how can you define a two-dimensional vector space uh, which is connected to a particle motion and which is defined in a covariant way. So let us begin by um, first discussing a three-dimensional and a one-dimensional subspace. So if you have a momentum which is not entirely zero, so some momentum which has at least some non-vanishing components, then you can immediately define two very nice subspaces of Minkowski space that we already had. Namely, you can for sure define a space which I call a transverse space, which is the space of uh, all the vectors which are orthogonal to P mu. So let's say all vectors V mu which are orthogonal to P mu. And uh, if that P is not entirely zero, this defines a three-dimensional subspace of Minkowski space and the definition is covariant. So if you Lorentz transform the P mu, then all the uh, Vs get also Lorentz transformed and uh, you get a nice covariant transformation of this uh, transverse space. So this would be a three-dimensional 
transverse space. Similarly, you can also nicely define a one-dimensional subspace, which I call VL, which is longitudinal, which is the space simply spanned by our P mu. So you can define the space of all the vectors which are proportional to P mu. This, of course, defines a one-dimensional space uh, of all the vectors proportional to P, and so we call that longitudinal. So that would be one-dimensional longitudinal. All right. But how can you define a two-dimensional space, which is somehow covariantly connected to the vector P? Okay. So in order to understand that point, let us first consider the case that we already know P square equal M square, which is non-zero. So now we go to specific cases of uh, four vectors, which are uh, corresponding to a massive particle. That was the case that we already know. Then this uh, Vt is actually the space which is spanned by our epsilons for lambda equal 1, 2, 3, right? The epsilons were exactly a basis of all the uh, vectors which are orthogonal to P mu. That was their definition. There are three linearly independent ones, and we made a specific choice, but that is now not important. Anyway, the three different epsilons for the massive vector field, they span exactly that transverse space. And we also know that uh, the longitudinal space is um, independent of the transverse space, and so the P, the momentum, uh, sorry. Together with the three epsilons, they span the full four-dimensional Minkowski space. So P is linearly independent of all the epsilons, and therefore the four epsilons plus P together give a basis of the full four-dimensional space. So that was the massive case. What, however, happens if we now take the massless limit? Now p square equal zero. What happens in the p square equal zero case? Something very special happens, namely what happens in, in this connection. Now p square is zero that means P is orthogonal to itself, even though the four vector P is not zero, but P is orthogonal to itself, P square vanishes. What does that mean in this context? It means that the VL space is actually not linearly independent of the transverse space, but instead it's part of the transverse space. So in the massless case, this longitudinal space is a subspace of the transverse space instead of being linearly independent. So, and that of course also means that the two together, they do not span the full four-dimensional space. They don't. They together uh, just span the remaining transverse space. They only span a three-dimensional subspace of Minkowski space. And if you would like to span the full Minkowski space, then it's not sufficient to take a basis of the transverse space plus P, but you need some fourth additional vector which is neither longitudinal nor transverse, but something else. So later when we want a full basis, we need a basis vector which is neither this nor that. But at the moment, we want to go from four to two degrees of freedom, and so how can we define a two-dimensional space? And now we have a possibility. Now we have a possibility because here we have a three-dimensional space, and here we have a one-dimensional subspace. And what can you do in linear algebra? 
if you have a three-dimensional space and a one-dimensional subspace, you can define a quotient space. And that will be two-dimensional. So let me do it in the right words. So if we have now uh, for all p mu which are not entirely zero and p square equals zero, we define now the following. So we can define a two-dimensional space, which is a quotient space, transverse divided by longitudinal. This is a quotient space uh, of equivalence classes. Uh, let me use this symbol here. Uh, is this a familiar symbol for you for equivalence classes? Okay. So, <clears throat> how are they defined? So just repeat everything, uh, this definition, in case you have forgotten what a quotient space is. It's a space of equivalence classes, and first of all, each representative that is allowed in this space needs to be orthogonal to P mu. And on the other hand, uh, two vectors v mu and v prime mu are equivalent by definition if and only if uh, the difference is an element of vt, in other words, has the form a times p mu. So if two vectors differ by a um, multiple of the momentum, then they are called equivalent and uh, then uh, all vectors which differ by uh, such a multiple of the momentum form one equivalence class. And then uh, this space here uh, is um, two-dimensional and it is spanned by two equivalence classes. What would be a basis of that space? A basis would, for example, be the basis of the two transverse polarization vectors. So one would be this epsilon mu with lambda equal 1 from uh, the massive case and the other one epsilon with lambda equal 2. We can take over the definitions from the massive case without problems here because these epsilons for lambda equal 1 and lambda equal 2, they are orthogonal to the four-dimensional p mu and in the spatial part, they are even also orthogonal to the spatial um, p mu, and so they are not multiples of the momentum p mu in four dimensions, and therefore they are non-vanishing basis elements of this space, and they are of course linearly independent. So this space here contains these two equivalence classes and all linear combinations of precisely these two equivalence classes, and so we have now defined a two-dimensional space. And uh, the definition is clearly covariant because we have only used covariant objects to define our space. So the transfer space uh, would undergo a covariant Lorentz transformation if you transform P, the longitudinal space, of course, also. And as a result, this um, space of equivalence classes is also defined in a covariant way. So this is the first insight of today. Namely, you will see now that it is actually possible to define such a covariant two-dimensional vector space, a subspace of Minkowski space. We, however, must be in the massless case. Only in the massless case this is possible, because only then uh, the longitudinal is a subspace of the transverse space, so we need to be in the massless case. And uh, in order to define our two-dimensional space, we need to have equivalence classes. So the key new idea that allows this construction is to introduce equivalence classes. So that is the first insight. Let us go to our second insight. We have already alluded to it uh, the last time 
we discussed a lot these polarization vectors epsilon mu and they were quite important to define our vector field A mu because uh, they span a basis connected to the creation and annihilation operators. And uh, so we can expect that in the massless case it is also useful to define such a basis of polarization vectors which uh, are connected to a massless momentum. So let us think simply uh, ahead of time already of such basis choices of polarization vectors. And let us immediately study their properties because it's obvious that that will be useful. Massless polarization vectors. So the key problem that we already saw is in the massive case we had a basis which spans the Minkowski space which consisted of three different epsilons and the momentum. And so in particular there was the lambda equal 3 polarization vector and the momentum and it, we already saw that if we take the massless limit or go to infinitely high energies then those two become linearly dependent uh, the difference goes to zero. So they become linearly dependent and therefore the basis which consists of the three epsilons and the momentum cannot be uh, used in the massless case. We need to really do a discreetly different choice if we want to have a basis of vectors spanning our Minkowski space. And so let us uh, invent such a new basis. So it, it cannot be continuously different from that. It must be different in a discrete way. And so we just need to make now a different choice. And so actually I want to show you two choices. Let us begin with one of them. So this choice will have lambda equal 1, 2, 3 and 0 for epsilons for these three lambdas. And let me immediately write down what is this choice because it's not difficult to grasp why it works. So for lambda equal 1 we simply choose the same as before. So we have here a spatial vector epsilon 1 which is orthogonal to the spatial momentum. And for lambda equal to exactly the same. Okay. And of course there is a basis of two linearly or in fact two orthogonal uh, vector epsilons which are also orthogonal to P. And we don't need to specify them explicitly, but it's clear that they exist and they are normalized and uh, orthogonal to P. Okay, but uh, so that is the same as before. But now let's think about the other two for lambda equal 3 and for lambda equal 0. What could be a third um, polarization vector, which is first of all linearly in independent of these two, but also uh, which spans then the full space together with the fourth one. And so one possibility is simply this. In the third case we still have here a zero in the first component and then we have here instead of those two we have the unit vector in momentum direction EP. Then it's clear that those three are already orthogonal to each other. They are all normalized in exactly the same way. So um, that is certainly a good choice and also a viable one. And then the question remains what is the fourth basis vector and now uh, you probably see what is necessary. We need something that has a non-zero entry there and so one simple choice, our choice is simply that one, one comma zero. <coughs> 
And then this last one is defined in a way which is not covariant. It's whatever we choose for p, the fourth epsilon is always this. So it has not Lorentz covariantly defined. It is defined explicitly always in this way with a 1 comma 0, no matter what momentum we have. But anyway, this is a good basis choice. It's clear that it's a basis, and uh, not only is it a basis, but it also satisfies some obvious completeness and orthogonality relations, namely the same as for the massive case. So we have here this epsilon mu of p and lambda contracted with epsilon mu for the same p but uh, lambda prime. Then you see that they are all mutually orthogonal. So we always get zero if we multiply two different ones. And if we multiply the same, then in these three cases, the product of itself gives minus one, because here in the spatial part we have a unit vector. And in that case, we get plus one. So that can be again written as this g lambda lambda prime. So we get plus one for this case and minus one for all the other cases in the normalization. And then we also have a completeness relation, sum over lambda from zero to three of epsilon mu, epsilon mu, with the same lambda and the same p, and open Lorentz indices mu nu. And what is the result of this? it is minus g mu nu, actually plus. And how can we prove it? We prove it again by trying whether the left-hand side and the right-hand side gives the same when we apply it to all basis vectors. And that is now extremely simple and obvious because all the basis vectors have this simple normalization. And so if you multiply that and this uh, with the epsilons, uh, ah, sorry, okay, uh, it, it was and here you need to put in this uh, g lambda lambda prime. That means that uh, the epsilons, they enter either with plus or with minus, depending on the lambda. And then indeed uh, you see that this works, because then if you apply it to any one of the basis vectors, you get from the product here, g lambda lambda prime times the other g lambda lambda prime gives exactly one, and then uh, the other epsilon remains. So this basis satisfies these simple orthogonality and completeness relations. And Therefore, it is a very useful basis, in particular, if we later connect it to creation and annihilation operators, which then also will have simple uh, orthogonality and co properties, which means commutation relations. Yes? I think it's just g lambda lambda, right? No lambda prime. Ah, OK, yes. G lambda lambda. And of course, yes. Here, no uh, lambda is not summed over in this alone, but it's an explicit number. Other questions? So this is one basis, and however, it's not the only useful basis uh, because it has a nice advantage. However, it also has a very, very obvious disadvantage. What is the obvious disadvantage of that basis? Right. That is a very obvious disadvantage, and uh, it is connected uh, to something else. Um, it, it is really not connected at all to the massive case, and in particular, the basis does not contain the momentum for a vector. And it is nice for various reasons if the momentum for a vector is somehow contained in, in our choice of the basis vectors. And so that would then also covariantly Lorentz transform. So let us uh, choose an alternative basis, which uh, takes this into account. Okay. 
an alternative basis for PMU and I will call it the 1-2-LS basis. So instead of the 3 and 0 vectors, we will define two new basis vectors which I call LS and uh, the 1 and 2, they remain. So the new one, epsilon mu for P and lambda equal L, L stands for longitudinal and that is proportional to the momentum P mu and I write it as 1 comma EP. Okay? So it's not exactly the momentum but it's kind of normalized and so you can also write it as the momentum for vector P mu divided by the P0 component. So it's also not completely Lorentz covariantly defined but at least it's proportional to the covariant P mu, but it has this normalization. And then we define epsilon P with lambda equal to S. And that is now uh, the fourth basis vector which must be linearly independent of all the other three. And so there is no way, at least I do not know of any way, to define it in a covariant way and therefore we just uh, do something which is linearly independent of the rest and we do 1 and minus EP. And then uh, this basis is useful because it contains this vector which is proportional to the momentum, but it has some disadvantages, in particular the orthogonality and completeness, they are much more complicated. And let me just write down an example. So for example, epsilon mu with S, epsilon mu with L, what is this product of those two different polarization vectors? This is now not zero, but what is it? Yep, it's two, exactly. So they are not orthogonal, but they are linearly independent, but not orthogonal to each other. And uh, the other thing, which is also noteworthy, if you do P mu, times epsilon mu for any of the lambdas, then what do you get? So P mu times epsilon mu for lambda equal 1 and 2, what do you get? Uh, P mu times epsilon for lambda equal 1 or 2? With those ones? That is of course 0, right? So that is 0. What happens if, uh, if you do P mu times the longitudinal epsilon. P mu times the longitudinal epsilon. What is that? It is of course also zero. Yeah. It's also zero, okay. What happens if you do P mu times the S? S stands for scalar, for the scalar epsilon. What is then the result? then you do not get zero, but instead you get P mu, uh, P zero plus P uh, uh, zero again, gives two times P zero. That is compatible with this result here, because it's the same up to the factor P zero. So you see the epsilons are not mutually orthogonal and also not all of them are orthogonal to P mu. They can't be all orthogonal to P mu, of course. But uh, the scalar one here is not. So this is um, our two alternative basis choices and each of those two basis choices will be useful and important for some purposes. And that is why we want to have both in mind. And I mean, you know, it's a basis and therefore if you have a basis expansion of some object in this basis vectors, then of course you can equivalently rewrite the coefficients by going from one basis to the other. So, but now we need to do a last point on the polarization vectors, namely we want to look at the Lorentz transformations. 
That is very important because we want to study afterwards the Lorentz transformation properties of our vector field, let's say an A mu field operator. How would that Lorentz transform? And clearly it must be useful to first know how the epsilons transform. And we have tried to make them as covariant as possible, but they are clearly, as we discussed, not all completely covariant. So that is not covariant for sure. And also the epsilon s is not completely covariant. So how do the epsilons behave under Lorentz? Let us do it in this alternative basis only. And since they are equivalent, you could uh, from that derive how the other epsilons Lorentz transform. And so we look at epsilon prime mu is defined as lambda mu nu times epsilon nu for any polarization vector. And we also have p prime mu is equal to lambda mu nu times p nu. And then the question is, how are the Lorentz transformed epsilons related to the polarization vectors of the transformed momentum? That is really our question. So we have on the one side epsilon prime mu of p comma lambda. Okay. So you take an epsilon, do a Lorentz transformation, and on the other side you can ask how does it relate to the epsilon of p prime for some lambda prime. If the epsilons were defined in a fully covariant way, then we would simply say epsilon prime is equal to lambda mu nu times epsilon. Maybe this. So the simplest uh, case would be this. All the epsilons are defined in a covariant way. So epsilon prime for one lambda is equal to lambda times epsilon of p prime for the same lambda. That would be a covariant uh, covariant behavior. And of course, that is not the case. It is not the case. It was not even the case for the massive uh, case, but here it's even more complicated. But we have four linearly independent epsilons. So they span the full four-dimensional space. And therefore, what we definitely know is that there must be uh, uh, some linear combination, C lambda lambda prime, such that the Lorentz transformed epsilon for one lambda is a linear combination. Uh, sorry, uh, that, that here is unnecessary. That here is unnecessary. It's just a linear combination of the polarization vectors for our transformed momentum. Such an expansion must exist because these four, they span a basis of the four-dimensional space and therefore the epsilon prime must have some expansion in those four epsilons. So there must be such a sum lambda equal one to ls of a matrix C lambda lambda prime. And this matrix C lambda lambda prime is of course a matrix which depends on the momentum P that we start from and it also depends on the Lorentz transformation lambda that we do. But anyway, the matrix must exist. It has two indices, lambda, lambda prime, which run over the four basis vectors. And then we can re-expand our Lorentz transform polarization vector. And now what we want to discuss is what are the properties of that matrix? In other words, which epsilon transforms into which? And that we can sketch. Let us just sketch the non-vanishing matrix elements. So hopefully a kind of self-explanatory schematic notation. So if we take, for example, on the left, lambda equal L. Okay? So let's just uh, write it in this schematic way. On the left, you have lambda equal L, and then you do a Lorentz transformation. In other words, I ask myself in this equation here, which of the coefficients are non-zero if I take lambda equal to L? 
lambda equal to L means that our epsilon is actually P mu itself divided by some normalization factor. But if you do a Lorentz transformation, then here on the left, you would get lambda mu nu times P nu, that is P prime mu, the Lorentz transformed four vector P prime. That is what you get on the left. And so what is then the expansion of that P prime mu in terms of the polarization vectors specific for the momentum P prime? Which of the four appears? Are you still with me? Oh, yes? Only the lambda equals L1. Right. Only the lambda equal L1 appears. So what I mean by this, and let me write it just once. So epsilon prime mu of P comma lambda is equal to uh, P prime mu divided by P without prime zero. And that is equal to epsilon mu of P prime comma L times uh, P zero prime over P zero. So that is what I really mean. Okay. That is what I mean. So if we have lambda L and Lorentz transform it, you get only uh, epsilon with lambda equal L on the right. Now let's do it for all the other cases in a similar way. What happens if you start out with lambda equal one or two? What happens if you start out with lambda equal one or two? If you start with lambda equal one or two, you have a polarization vector which is orthogonal to P mu. So epsilon uh, dot P equals zero. That is what you start out with. So then you do a Lorentz transformation, then you know that uh, the Lorentz transformed epsilon prime times P prime is still zero. What does that mean for our basis expansion? If you want to expand this epsilon prime in terms of our new basis, then only basis vectors may appear, which are themselves orthogonal to P prime. So which basis vectors are orthogonal to P prime? Only one, two, and L but not S. So it's clear that the scalar epsilon, which is the only one which is not orthogonal to P, that cannot appear in the expansion. So S is missing here. That is the information. So L goes to L, 1, 2 goes to 1, 2, and L. So is the L here necessary? Or could it be that maybe the 1, 2 only transform into 1, 2 themselves, but the L is unnecessary here. It's in general necessary. We cannot do anything about it. We see it, for example, by doing a Lorentz transformation of the epsilons uh, with lambda equal 1. We have a 0 in the 0 component. And in a general Lorentz transformation, we will always produce a non-zero entry in the 0 component. Therefore, it's clear that we must, uh, in the basis expansion, have at least one basis vector which has a non-zero entry in the zero component. Therefore, it's clear that that is in general necessary. So, and what about S? About S, we know nothing, and it can just go into anything. So, there is no information that we can get from this. And so that is what we know. So this is how our basis vectors transform. And so in the case of Lorentz transformation, the alternative basis uh, behaves in a simpler way, in particular because of L to L only, and so on. And so we have this kind of information. So now we have polarization vectors for massless momenta. And now we can go and discuss immediately the quantum theory of a field operator for a massless um, spin one particle. So that is our section 263, the expected Poincare properties.
Okay, so bypassing all the blueprint uh, typical derivations, it is clear that at the end we will have a field operator. So we expect that we will get some field operator a mu hat of x. And what do we expect this field operator to look like? We surely expect it to start with a dp tilde integration measure, which implements the equation that p square is equal to zero. Then we expect a sum over lambda for the different polarization vectors, and then we have here epsilon mu of p comma lambda times some operators a of p comma lambda times e to the minus ipx plus the Hermitian conjugate of the same thing. That is what we always had, and it is quite clear that we should get something similar now. And in the case of the massive field, the lambdas extended over one, two, three, the three polarization vectors which are orthogonal to P in order to implement this Lorentz gauge condition, which was a consequence of the Broca equation. But here we do not yet know, so let us uh, simply write here first lambda equals zero up to three. And uh, maybe like in the massive case, not all the lambdas are important, then it would just mean that some of the operators here could be set to zero without problem. So we remain completely general at this point. And we can set operators to zero later. But we expect some operator like this to appear. And of course, as always, we also expect in our theory a unitary representation of the Poincaré group. So we also expect that we have operators u of lambda and a. And they should uh, generate Lorentz transformations on our Hilbert space of states. And they should also generate Lorentz and Poincaré transformations of the field operator. It was always like that. So let us write down the expected relationship. The expected relationship is this one, q dagger of lambda a times a hat of lambda x plus a times u without dagger of lambda a. This essentially generates a Poincaré transformation of the field operator. And if that field operator has the um, property of being a real four vector uh, field operator, then it has a certain Poincaré transformation, namely that must be lambda mu nu times a mu at x. So this is the direct generalization of what we always had in all the previous cases. And uh, let us study this expectation. What can we learn if that is true? Then we get a lot of information and let us evaluate that information with our previous knowledge of how the epsilon's Lorentz transform and uh, the physics of um, spin one particles. We can extract all of this information from that expectation here. Okay, so the first consequence that we can draw from that expected property of Lorentz transformations and the field operator is what we always did also in the scalar case and spin one half case. What is the spin of the particles that are created by this field operator? So we have here A and A dagger. They of course will generate one particle states, multi-particle states in our Hilbert space. And we always asked what is the spin of those states and what did we do? We looked at a one particle state and acted on it with an angular momentum operator. And how did we know how the angular momentum operator acts? We know it from this equation. That equation exactly tells us the Lorentz transformation of those A daggers, and therefore it also tells us the Lorentz transformation of the states created by the A daggers. And so from this we always could conclude how the uh, actual A daggers Lorentz transform, and we got it by looking at the Fourier coefficients in front of, for example, e to the ipx. If you look at this equation and extract the Fourier coefficient in front of e to the ipx, then you get the Lorentz transformation of the A-deckers. So if we do that here, 
what actually happens. So on the left hand side of the equation, in front of the e to the i px, we have a sum over lambda from 0 to 3. Then we have an epsilon, epsilon mu of t comma lambda. And then we have u decker and u, and in between we have our creation operator. U. Let me just drop the arguments. u decker of a decker of p prime and lambda and u. Okay. Why p prime? Uh, and here also p prime. Why p prime? Because our field a hat is evaluated at the primed argument. And so we can also uh, do a variable substitution in the exponential function. So we have here p prime. And on the right hand side of the equation, what do we have here? Sum over lambda from 0 to 3. And here we simply have lambda mu nu times epsilon mu of p comma lambda times a dagger uh, also of p comma lambda. I need to drop the arguments. That is our equation. And so we can read off from here what is the Lorentz transformation property and Poincaré of uh, the A-dagger. And actually, let me drop the translations. Let me all, only do it for Lorentz transformations. So. Uh, let us make the equation a little bit nicer by relabeling the dummy index lambda here. Let's call it lambda prime. Then we have here lambda prime, lambda prime everywhere. But on the right hand side, let us leave the lambda. And then we have on the left hand side um, a sum over lambda prime. And we have Lorentz transformations in uh, operator sense of a decker of lambda prime. And on the right hand side, we have a linear combination of A deckers of lambda. So we get that the Lorentz transformation of such a, a creation operator is a linear combination of other creation operators. That is what we get. And so let us now uh, evaluate this. Uh, maybe let me. Yeah, let me let's maybe squeeze here one more line, and then we have here a nicer uh, conclusion on the new blackboard. So we have here a sum over lambda and lambda prime because this here is now a sum over our um, over our epsilon primes, the Lorentz transformed polarization vectors. Right, that appears on the right hand side. But the Lorentz transform polarization vectors, they can be written as a linear combination of the original polarization vectors at the new momentum. And so we can now insert exactly that equation over there. And then instead of this, we get a sum over lambda prime with this matrix C lambda lambda prime times epsilon mu of P prime comma lambda prime a dagger of p comma lambda. And there you have it. On the left hand side we have a sum and a linear combination of epsilons of p prime and lambda prime. And on the right hand side we also have a linear combination of epsilons of p prime and lambda prime. And therefore those are four linearly independent numerical four vectors. And therefore, the coefficient of each epsilon polarization vector for each lambda prime must be the same on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation. And then we can read off directly the Lorentz transformation of this, because that is one coefficient of one such epsilon. And if we look at the coefficient of the same epsilon on the right, then we get exactly the result of that operation. And that is what I want to write down now. So we have, so we need to look at the coefficient of the epsilons of p prime and lambda prime. And then on the left hand side, we get u dagger of lambda 
times a dagger of, uh, let's say, p, comma, lambda prime, p prime and lambda prime, sorry, and u of lambda. And on the right hand side, we get only the sum over lambda without prime, matrix C lambda lambda prime, and a dagger of p and lambda. So here you see how our creation operators um, Lorentz transform, and they Lorentz transform into linear combinations of uh, original creation operators uh, multiplied with a matrix, and that matrix is the same matrix as the one that appears in the transformation of the epsilons. So if we work in the uh, basis with L and S, then it's simpler, and then we have creation operators corresponding to this L and S polarization, and they will have this simple Lorentz transformation. And let me us write down again, what are the non-vanishing contributions in a similar schematic way as above. And so you see here that the transpose matrix actually is relevant. So here, lambda prime goes to lambda, but with C lambda, lambda prime. So it's the transpose matrix which is now relevant. So suppose we have here on the left-hand side S. Here we have S. And then we do this uh, U dagger and U transformation from the left and right of the corresponding creation operator. So it means lambda prime is now S. And uh, what are the non-vanishing terms? The non-vanishing terms are the ones where here on the right where S appears. S appears only here. Here lambda prime is S. And that appears only in one place. Namely, it appears only in the place where lambda is S as well. So that tells us here if lambda prime is S in the sum over lambda, we only get one contribution from the S itself. So a dagger of S transforms only into a dagger of S. So it's kind of Lorentz invariant in a certain sense. How about the others? So for example, uh, how about L? L, lambda prime is now L. Lambda prime is L, so we need to look where is here L appearing uh, in the lambda prime column. L, 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 L appears everywhere. That means uh, C can be non-zero if lambda prime is L for any lambda. That means L could go into 1, 2, S, L, into anything. And in particular, I asked this before, is it really true that on the right hand side this 1 and 2 appears with a non-zero coefficient? Yes, because we already said at the same place here, uh, sorry, here, 1, 2 will definitely go into L with a non-vanishing coefficient that is necessary. And for the same reason, uh, we have here 1, 2 appearing with non-zero coefficients. They are the same non-zero coefficients here. So L will mix into 1 and 2. And what about 1 and 2? 1 and 2 appear here. They can go into 1 and 2. But they also appear there. So they can go into S. 1 and 2 can go into S, but not into L. So these are the non-vanishing Lorentz transformations of our creation or annihilation operators. So that is interesting to know. And uh, the next physical uh, question that we want to tackle is really, what is uh, the physical nature of the particles that are described by this um, quantum field and by the creation operators? And maybe or maybe not, you can already guess that the 1, 2 entries correspond to the physical states, to the transverse states of the photon. Whereas this S and L, they are kind of unphysical. Um, so therefore, let us first focus on the behavior of 1 and 2. And the outcome will indeed be 
that uh, these have the properties of uh, a massless spin one particle or like the photon. But let's prove it. And we prove it exactly in the same way as we always did it by going not into the rest frame but into a simple frame. And then we act with angular momentum operators onto particles in that frame and we see what happens. And the outcome will be spin one. So that is the question, the physical meaning of the polarizations lambda equal 1 and 2. And so what do we do? We go to a special frame where the momentum of our massless particles is uh, this P00P. Zero zero P. That means we uh, move in the z direction with the speed of light. Then uh, we use, in this case, we go back to our uh, other basis, to the first basis, then the sum over lambda from 0 to 3 of this epsilon and uh, a dagger. How does this sum actually look like? You know, uh, the polarization vectors for that particular momentum, they are very, very simple in this first basis because uh, the epsilon 1 is simply, uh, okay, so they are just unit vectors, all of them. All the polarization vectors are simply uh, 0, 0, 0, 1 and 1, 1, 1, 0, 0 and so on. So for lambda equals 0, the epsilon had this 1, 0, 0, 0. So if you multiply them in the upper component, we get a dagger of 0. Then our epsilon with lambda equal 1 is the vector 0, 1, 0, 0. So we get here in the second component a dagger of 1. Then the polarization vector for lambda equal 2 is 0, 0, 1, 0. So we get here a dagger of 2. And uh, for lambda equal 3, we get 0, 0, 0, 1. And so uh, that is very simply how uh, this sum looks explicitly written down. So therefore we have uh, at our disposal immediately all the four different a decker operators. And that of course would go into our field operator at the top of the other blackboard. So you can imagine that sum here uh, looks now like this. Then we consider a rotation around the z-axis, jz, which is of course an abbreviation for j12. And a Lorentz transformation, lambda, which is actually a rotation around the z-axis. How does the 4x4 Lorentz transformation look like, which corresponds to that rotation? It's the following. So in the 0, 0 component, we have 1, and then we have here cosine theta minus sine theta plus sine theta, cosine theta, and then here again a 1. That generates a rotation around the z-axis with the angle theta, and so that corresponds in our infinitesimal form omega 1, 2. Omega 1, 2 is the infinitesimal element here in this 1, 2 element. The infinitesimal uh, term here, omega 1, 2, is now minus theta. And so that means omega 1, 2 with lower index is plus theta. And then it means our u of lambda which is always unit operator minus i over 2 omega mu nu j mu nu. Now only this omega 1, 2 is non-zero and uh, it's actually plus theta. So we get here 1 minus i theta j times jz. So the 1 half drops out because omega 1, 2 is equal to minus omega 2, 1. Okay, so we have then everything very, very explicitly, very explicitly in front of us. All the matrices, all the operators are completely written down explicitly. And so it, we can now really evaluate 
uh, the action of our uh, U transformation onto the generators. So U dagger of lambda times uh, the sum over epsilon and A dagger. So like here on the blackboard, A dagger of zero up to A dagger of three times U of lambda. That should now be equal to the Lorentz transformation lambda mu nu times A dagger of zero and so on up to A dagger of three. Okay, maybe it's too long-winded and too detailed what we are doing here, but you should really see now totally explicitly what happens. So here, this u dagger of lambda, u dagger of lambda is now one plus i theta jz. That is one minus i theta jz. And that is the unit matrix Kronecker omega delta mu nu plus omega mu nu, and in omega mu nu we only have one non-vanishing entry, which is the omega 1, 2, which is theta. So, therefore, in order theta, you can now read off what happens. So, in order theta, we have on the left-hand side i times theta times the commutator of Jz with all those operators, a dagger of 0 up to a dagger of 3. That is what happens on the left-hand side. And what happens on the right-hand side in order theta? In order theta on the right-hand side, so we get here nothing in order theta in that component. We get nothing in the lowest component, but we only get something non-zero in the middle two components, and in the upper component we get minus theta times a dagger of 2, so it's reversed, and in this component we get plus theta times a dagger of 1. Now, super explicit calculation, but it allows you to read off explicitly all the commutators. Commutator of Jz with a dagger of 0 vanishes. Commutator of Jz with a dagger of 3 vanishes commutator of Jz with a dagger of 1 gives uh, minus a dagger, dagger of 2. So we have to multiply with i minus i. Then did I make a mistake? No. Okay, so therefore, maybe let's just squeeze here into that box the final result, namely a commutator of Jz with a dagger of 1. So let's leave here some space. Commutator of Jz with a dagger of 1 multiplied with minus i gives plus i times a dagger of 2. Plus i times a dagger of 2. Let's leave here some space. And the commutator of Jz with a dagger of 2 gives minus i times a dagger of 1. And so we can combine them by saying commutator of this with a dagger of 1 plus minus i times a dagger of 2. Then we can write down both immediately. So this here gives uh, that. And then we have here plus or minus a dagger of 1 plus or minus i times a dagger of 2. We can check it. So a dagger of 1 gives always i times a dagger of 2, and plus minus i a dagger of 2 gives plus minus a dagger of 1. How does that look like? It looks like this linear combination of operators generates an eigenstate of the operator Jz with eigenvalue plus 1. And the linear combination with minus generates an eigenstate of Jz with eigenvalue minus 1. So these operators generate Jz eigenstates. And the eigenvalues are plus minus 1. So let us write that down on a nice blackboard. 
that shows you that those operators here create photon states or spin, uh, spin one massless particle states uh, which have the correct property, namely we already know from Poincaré discussions that uh, only helicity counts for massless particles and uh, we have a particle which moves with a speed of light in z-direction and we look at the angular momentum in z-direction. That is the helicity. So we see that those operators composed out of lambda equal 1 and 2, they generate eigenstates of helicity with eigenvalues plus minus 1. That are exactly the states which are physical and which are physically necessary. So let us write the conclusion as a kind of nice text. So we get two linearly independent creation operators A dagger 1 plus minus i times A dagger of 2 for states with eigenvalues of helicity, which is the spin in p direction. with felicity equal to plus or minus one. And it is quite clear from the construction that this would hold not only for this particular momentum in z direction, but it would hold completely analogously for any momentum in any direction. because in our basis, the lambda equal one and two, they are orthogonal to the p momentum in uh, the spatial part of the forward vector. And uh, that is what guarantees this property here. And so the two physical degrees of freedom of a massless a particle with helicity or a spin plus minus one they are described by the lambda equal one and two part of our formalism. So actually, uh, the creation and annihilation operators for lambda equal one and two, they are completely sufficient. They are sufficient and necessary to describe correctly a massless spin one particle, like a photon. And uh, that is nice. We have understood the meaning of this lambda equal one and two. We have explicitly looked at the rotational properties of those states. They are exactly the correct ones. But now, of course, this raises the question, what about the other uh, operators that we have in our formalism for lambda equals zero and three? They are apparently not necessary to describe the spin one particle, so they are kind of unphysical. We have no interpretation for them yet. And in fact, they will remain unphysical. They are unphysical, they are not necessary to describe physical states but they are necessary in our formalism for various reasons and uh, to fulfill various properties. Let us spend another few minutes on discussing, instead of lambda equal one and two, let us discuss also lambda equal s, this uh, scalar degree of freedom. That uh, is also easy to interpret. You can understand where it comes from and what it means and what is its role quite easily. And a key property you see above at the upper blackboard still, namely 
S goes only into S. What does that mean? If you start out with a S particle or with a state of S type, you do a Poincaré transformation, it remains S. I already told you S stands for scalar. So that is like the property of a spin zero state. A spin zero state, if you transform it, it has only one single degree of freedom, it remains this degree of freedom. So this behaves like a scalar field uh, and it somehow would correspond to spin zero. So let us make that a little bit more explicit. So let A data S goes under U of lambda just to something proportional to A dagger of S. And uh, you can understand why this is the case in a very simple and useful way. Namely, please look at the following combination. B mu A mu, which was zero in the massive case, right? That was zero in the massive case, but now in the massless case, we don't know what that is. But uh, it looks for sure Lorentz invariant. That looks like a Lorentz invariant or covariant object. It looks like a scalar field. This looks like a scalar field. And behaves as a scalar field. And, uh, but what is it actually? If we plug in the expansion that was on some of the blackboards, the expansion, dp tilde integral, and then the sum over lambda, can you do it uh, on your own? What happens if you contract with, p, uh, with d mu? What happens in our sum over lambda? So the d mu, in the integral, it gets, it hits the exponential function e to the minus ipx. So therefore, the d mu effectively becomes minus ip mu. So then inside of the integral, you have a contraction of p mu with the epsilons, p mu times epsilon mu. So p mu times epsilon mu is often zero. Uh, then those terms where it's zero do not contribute. Which of the terms are non-zero? In the alternative basis, it's only the lambda equal s term. So only the lambda equal s term in the alternative basis remains. And so then we get the contraction of that lambda equals, so maybe let's write it down. So the sum doesn't exist anymore. There is only lambda equal s, we have minus i. And then p mu times lambda epsilon mu of p and lambda equal s only then times a of p comma s e to the minus i p x plus the same emission conjugate term. And so that contraction is whatever it is. What is it? It depends on our normalization of this epsilon mu. And the result was uh, two times the energy, two times p zero. So we have minus two i p0 times a of p comma s e to the minus i p x plus the Hermitian conjugate of this. And so now d mu a mu, the operator, really looks like a scalar field operator expansion. But the um, creation operators for that scalar field, they have now an unusual normalization, basically minus i p zero times a. That takes the role of our creation annihilation operator of our scalar field. And so, but up to that normalization, which is not important, you see that this a of s just behaves like the creation operator for a scalar field, a Klein-Gordon field, which describes a spin zero particle. Let's write the name Brian Gordon field operator with a creation operator proportional to a dagger of p comma s. And so that shows you that the a dagger of p comma s with the s label the scalar 
uh, would describe something like a spin zero state. And uh, it uh, might also depend on what we want, but if we want to describe a massless spin one particle, then we do not want uh, to describe those spin zero particles which are created by this A dagger of S, so we would call them unphysical. And we have to remove them from our theory. For example, we have to remove them somehow from our Hilbert space of states. As I told you in the beginning, with our experience, we could immediately jump to certain critical points in our derivation. And so that was, of course, the center of our today's discussion. We have now seen various critical points, namely how is a massless spin one particle contained in such an AMU uh, field operator? And how uh, is the role of the four different creation operators, A decker of lambda, how is it connected? to the physical particles that we have. And let me now draw some conclusions from the discussion in the sense that we write now down the problems that we see that we are faced with when we quantize spin one particles and fields. So let us start from this if our field operator AMU really behaves in the way that we have just discussed. Okay? That was an expectation, okay? It was an expectation and uh, if the expectation is true then we have already derived the consequences and now let us uh, spell it out explicitly. So if that is true, what we have just described, then it means that this A dagger of S and A dagger of L, they are unphysical. They create unphysical states. So that is then a fact of life. The A dagger of S corresponds to spin zero, which we don't want. And the A dagger of L, that has no interpretation at all. But anyway, both are unphysical. And that is not even our, own, uh, our only problem because we already saw some lectures ago that we also expect anyway something else. Namely, if we have a Lorentz covariant A mu field operator, which we now assume to have, then uh, we expect negative norm in our Hilbert space because the A mu, A nu, uh, they, that will, would give rise to matrix elements that behave like G menu, the metric tensor, with positive and negative entries. Therefore, we expect negative norm. Which is also a problem. So that was in section 251. So, but the good thing about this expectation is that we assume the field to be Lorentz covariant and so that is certainly nice. Uh, and the Lorentz transformation properties, we have discussed them and so they told us that a decker of one and two, the physical polarization, they transform under U of lambda to a decker of one, two, and S. So they transform from something physical into something non-physical. And if we start with L, then we go to 1 and 2 and L. So out of something unphysical, we are Lorentz, we create something physical. And therefore there is a mixing between physical and unphysical degrees of freedom under these Lorentz transformations. Unphysical and physical degrees of freedom mix under 
u of lambda. So that is one problem. Unphysical states and they mix uh, within Lorentz transformations. So, and uh, basically the equivalent problem can be formulated in the opposite way. Namely, you could now say, okay, our discussion tells us that we have unphysical degrees of freedom which we don't want. So, let's throw them away. Okay, let's throw them away. Let's say we don't have them. So, let's try to remove them. Let's try to remove a dagger of L and S. And that would mean in our quantum field operator that we simply say, let's say we define a physical AMU operator, AMU physical, which is then the same expansion, but we sum only over lambda equal one and two times the rest. We simply drop the unphysical terms in our field operator AMU. Okay, what happens then? Then nicely in our theory we only have physical particle states for physical polarizations of a spin one massless particle. But we encounter some other problem, namely which problem do we encounter? Of course, this operator is now not Lorentz covariant anymore because we have dropped something which mixes under Lorentz transformations with the physical degrees of freedom. So this thing cannot have this typical Lorentz transformation that it goes under u of lambda into lambda mu nu times a nu. So let us make that explicit and let us make explicit what happens instead. So. Let's say so assume that the Lorentz transformations of a dagger of lambda equal one and two remain because we have seen from our little discussion that the Lorentz transformation properties of those two they are correct in the sense that they are really the ones for a massless spin one particle, so that is nice. So let us keep those Lorentz transformations, but simply set uh, the others to zero, A, L and S, simply set them to zero by hand. If we do that, then one thing is not so problematic, namely actually this a dagger of p comma s equals zero, that is kind of okay, because you see that if you, uh, uh, you don't see it anymore, if you set it to zero in the Lorentz transformations, it is consistent. Because you could set it uh, to zero on the right hand side of some Lorentz transformations, then you simply say the operator is zero. And if you have it on the left hand side, uh, then it transforms into itself. So zero goes into zero. That is also consistent. So that is actually consistent. However, if you set the L to zero, that is not consistent because under Lorentz, L must go into one and two. So if you set the L to zero, but it must transform into one and two, then you have a contradiction. You cannot have that the Lorentz transformation of zero is a certain well-defined linear combination of one and two. And that is the inconsistency. And uh, so uh, uh, time is very short. So, but maybe we just figure it out. What is the resulting problem? Difficult to figure out what is the problem because we simply look at the Lorentz transformation behavior of this AL on its own that is then missing and uh, whatever the AL contributes will be the mistake.
So the mismatch is now the following. Let us simply look at this Hue dagger of lambda and we take our field operator uh, only the term from uh, the L generators of lambda x times U of lambda. And then we have here our integral dp tilde and uh, then the sum over lambda Okay, well first, uh, let's say, uh, no sum over lambda, but we only consider the term epsilon mu um, p prime l, then mu dagger of lambda a of p prime l u of lambda plus the Hermitian conjugate times e to the minus ipx. Okay, and then we already know what is the Lorentz transformation of this a of l. So it is, of course, a sum over lambda of this c l lambda, this matrix times a of p prime of lambda and the epsilon of L we can actually plug it in so that is a prefactor times P um, P mu or let's P prime uh, mu but that is lambda mu mu times p mu, sorry to rush a little bit, sum over lambda c l lambda a of p prime lambda e to the minus i p x. But the main point is now very simply the following. We can write the p which appears here as a prefactor, and of course we need to divide by one over p prime zero. But the p can be written as a derivative and that can be pulled out of the integral. So this is um, i times d by dx nu lambda mu nu times some object. And let me now abbreviate our lives by not writing down the rest. But this can be written as a derivative and uh, therefore the whole thing, uh, the lambda mu nu is not important. So it can be written as a derivative d x mu of some object. Let's call it d mu of some operator omega, which depends on x. And the ome omega operator is some linear combination of all the generators here. A and A dagger of P and all the lambdas in particular of the lambda equal one and two terms they contribute because uh, there are non-vanishing matrix elements between L and one two. Therefore uh, the physical A's they appear here in the sum and so the point is that the Lorentz transformation of this extra part of the field operator can be written as a total derivative of some complicated operator expression. And so that brings us to the conclusion of the chapter. So therefore, if you drop this term from our field operator, then you get a negative problem. So let me write this u dagger of lambda times the physical a mu of lambda x times u of lambda. That is on the one hand indeed lambda mu nu times a nu of x. That is what we want. But from this discussion, we get an extra term plus d mu of some operator omega. 
which is an operator which depends on everything in particular also on the Lorentz transformation and uh, therefore our field operator which consists only of physical degrees of freedom does not covariantly Lorentz transform. But what is the problematic term? The problematic term looks like a gauge transformation. And so that is how you see that you can repair Lorentz invariance by imposing gauge invariance. And I think that is what we will start with tomorrow with this little discussion and then tomorrow we collect all the informations that we now have and form hopefully a uniform consistent picture. Okay, so let us stop for today and continue tomorrow with this topic.